I haven't been there too. Well, I haven't gotten that conviction yet. We have to stop thinking that just because we are convicted of something that it's not sin. And if the, the Holy Spirit, who is the spirit of truth, so if there is one spirit, there is one spirit of truth. If that one spirit of truth desired to reveal this truth to us, he desires to reveal this truth to all those who have his spirit. There's one spirit. There is one body. So it's not a sin for, you know, half of the believers to be in these orgies, and then it's not okay for the other half. Just God wants all of his children to come out, to come out from among them. The darkness and light have no business being together. Hey y'all, hey, it's your girl Lala Jenkins back with another YouTube video. So in this, ooh, come on, come on, because y'all seen the title. We are exposing the divine nine, okay? Uh, but before I actually get into the video, if you have not already, hit the subscribe button for your girl one time for the one time. Okay. All right. All right. So this, the Lord says, start with this. Okay. So this video is an assignment from God. Okay. This entire idea, this entire panel is um, instructed by the Lord. Okay. So we are essentially fulfilling the assignment from God with this video. Okay. And so what he wants us to do is to discuss the different aspects of the divine nine organizations compared to scripture. Okay. So compared to, I don't have my Bible, but compared to the word of God. Okay. So that's essentially what we are going to be doing. And so the Lord also wants me to clarify that this video is not against the people that are in these organizations. Okay. This video is against the root, the demonic roots of the organizations, okay? And so we are going to be using scripture to expose the demonic roots, okay? And so the Lord has um, has sent me some amazing women and men of God who are going to, um, essentially, we're just gonna have a conversation. That's it, we're just gonna have a conversation and the camera just happens to be here, okay? And so I'm going to bring uh, my panel on now. Okay, so I have Ashton, Marcus, Chelsea, and Tori that are here with me. Thank y'all so much for accepting the call to fulfill this assignment, okay? I know this is not something that is easy to do, and so the Lord is extremely pleased, and he is going to cover us while we fulfill this assignment, okay? And so um, what I'm actually going to start off with is introductions, okay? So I'm going to start with myself. I am Lala, okay? I crossed into Delta Sigma Theta in spring of 2008, and I denounced in fall of 2021, okay? And so um, I was a Delta about 12, 13 years. I was doing all these crazy, not crazy, but just I was doing all these Delta videos on YouTube, and this lady sent me a video and I clicked the video and it was a denouncing video, okay? And so I said, the devil is a lie. I uh, did not look at the video. And so the Lord would not let me rest until I looked at the video. And so after I watched the video, I heard the Lord say, it's either him or Delta, him or Delta, him or Delta. And so that day in my room, I decided to choose God over Delta. Okay. And so I denounced in fall of 2021 and here we are. Okay. And so the next person is Ashton. If you don't mind introducing yourself for the people of God that are watching. Amen. What's up everybody. Like Lala said, my name is Ashton. I crossed into Kappa Alpha Psi back in spring 2016. And I ended up renouncing just last year in August of 2022. So, yeah, I was in almost seven years. My testimony is, you know, I went on a fast last year. The Lord called me on a fast last year in the beginning of August. Um, you know, the, it just so happened that the last day of the fast was a wedding for one of my former line brothers. So I was already contemplating, you know, all right, God, what's going to happen? Um, so during the fast, the scripture that the Lord really used to tug on my heart is in the Psalms where David said, you know, let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable unto you, God. And in that same psalm, he says, you know, reveal to me the hidden sins in my heart. Don't allow me to be in you know, unrepentant sin. And so I asked the Lord to show me any sins in my heart that I was unaware of that was not pleasing to him. And the first thing that came to the surface was Kappa Alpha Psi. So during this 20 day fast, I was kind of, you know, going back like, OK, God, like, are you really calling me to completely renounce to come out and be public? Or can I just kind of stay in the background because I was already in the background, you know, kind of already distant. 
But the Lord made it very clear to me that the same way I publicly came in, I needed to publicly come out. And so one day opened up my YouTube and we all know how YouTube, you know, the algorithm, it'll bring you videos related to topics that you're usually watching. So I had not watched anything Greek in years just because I didn't care. Like I didn't want to see any probates or anything. But this day, the first video is a video titled God is calling me out of my sorority, why I renounced. And so the video was like 45 minutes. So I was like, all right, God, I don't really want to watch this long video, but I just felt a very strong conviction to watch it. And so by the end of the video, I completely renounced, uh, got up running around my house, threw away everything. And that's what led me here today. Glory to God. Glory to God. Okay, Marcus. Hello, everybody. My name is Marcus, and I had pledged uh, into Phi Beta Sigma in fall of 2000, a long time ago. And uh, I hadn't really been active in the fraternity after I crossed, even though I was in it for well over 20 years. Uh, there was a friend of mine, a Messianic Jewish evangelist, and he was telling me about men of God who are in secret societies. And I was like, wow, that, you know, no one ever really talked about that before. And he asked me, he said, Marcus, are you in a secret society? I said, no, but I'm in a fraternity. At that point, I didn't know that fraternities were part of a secret society. I thought about Skull and Bones and the Masons as secret societies. But he said, no, Marcus, that is a secret society and you are under a false God. And that about knocked me to the ground when he said that to me. He said, yeah, you're serving a false God. I said, what? So of course I, I you know, researched, uh, I went on YouTube and sure enough, I, I saw all these denouncement videos and I was like, wow, this is crazy. Cause back in 2000, early 2000s, you didn't really have, there wasn't YouTube like that. So that wasn't easily available. You didn't really know too much about it uh, like it is now. But I you know, long story short, I renounced in August of 2021. And um, the Lord, like Ashton said, you know, um, <laughs> I did not want to go public with it because I was afraid of backlash. But just like in Jeremiah, he said, you know, the word was shot up. It was like fire shot up in his bones. And the Lord was like, you got to do this. And I couldn't resist it. I could not resist it. I had to do that video. And I did my denouncing and renouncement video uh, in August of actually, no, August of uh, last year, I believe. And so, um, you know, I praise God for that. You know, it was it wasn't easy at first to actually do it, to get the courage to do it. But the Lord gave me that boldness to do it. So here we are. Come on, boldness from the Lord. Glory to God. Okay, Chelsea. Hi, I'm Chelsea. And um, I originally crossed in fall 14 to Zeta Phi Beta Sorority Incorporated. And so mine is a little different. I publicly denounced in, um, I guess, maybe the spring of 2016. And I say publicly because I still have one foot in, one foot out. That eventually almost, well, it led me to returning to like the scripture that says a dog returning to their vomit. So mine is a cautious tale of just being important, uh, being mindful of things that the Lord delivers you from and really um, those doors because um, I thought that chapter was over and slowly bit by bit it came and crept back into my life. And then that ultimately led me to um, publicly denouncing again and spiritually denouncing um, in summer of 2022. Amen. Glory to God. Glory to God, Chelsea. Okay, Tori. Hi, everybody. Um, my name is Tori Hartley, and um, I was a member of Alpha Kappa Alpha. I crossed in fall 2010, and I denounced in August, well, the fall of 2022. Um, my journey was a long one, uh, before I started in Alpha Kappa Alpha, I prayed and I asked God to show me, you know, if this is demonic or if there's some things that I shouldn't be doing. And he did, but I ignored it. So throughout my entire time, throughout my entire process of joining, um, and also throughout my entire experience, there were times where I decided, okay, I'm not going to say the pledge. I'm not going to sing the hymn because I know that it doesn't feel right. Um, it feels wrong. And I looked up scripture um, in Deuteronomy, actually, Deuteronomy chapter six, verses four, you shall love the, the Lord your God with all your heart and mind and with all your soul and with all your strength. And that merit the pledge that we were saying. Um, and still, yet and still, I still kind of ignored it um, and thought like, oh, okay, it's it's all right. And then fast forward to 2022, excuse me, 2022, yes, 
the summer of 2022, um, a woman at a prayer conference that I was at came up to me and told me what the Lord told her to tell me, which is to denounce my organization. Um, I struggled with that for a bit. I was in denial. I told her, I don't think you're talking about me. There's a lot of other people in Greek organizations um, in the church, and there are people here in this space, and you you can't possibly be talking about me. Um, and she she was, and and God God told her, and she was obedient. And so after that, I struggled for a little bit. I ignored that, and then one day I asked God to reveal why. I asked Him why. I don't understand why. He revealed it to me through His Word. He brought back rituals. He brought back things that I'd done. I didn't have to look it up because he brought it back. And then I went into the Bible and I and I compared it to the word of God and I cried and I realized what I had done. So just like um, my fellow colleagues here, I, I ended up renouncing the organization, sending in my letter um, and then finally being not fearful to publicly come out this year in January um, 2023. And that's where I did an interview with Lala. So it took a long time, um, mm -hmm. but I'm definitely here as a testimony to encourage you all that you you can do it. You don't have to have the fear. Um, even if it takes a while, God will get you there. Amen. Glory to God, Tori. Thank you for, for your, your testimony. Okay. So we are going to transition into the video. And so, like I said in the introduction, we are going to do, um, we're going to address different aspects of the divine nine compared to scripture. Okay. And so before we get into the discussion, Ashton, did you want to share what the meaning of divine actually means? Cause I actually have not researched it. So this is going to be good information for me to know as well. Yeah, I think it's important for us even just to get the word because, you know, we know the enemy is so, so sneaky. He will try to just sneak in there and try to mimic. I believe Chelsea mentioned in her interview that she did with you before how the enemy will try to pervert whatever is from God. So it's important for us to really, and this is why the scripture says to study to show ourselves approved. We have to really study. So a lot of the times when you hear divine nine, you automatically just assume, oh, it's divine. It's from heaven. It's of God. You know, it's it's Christian. But the meaning of divine literally says, it says of, from, or like God with a capital G. And then it says, or a lowercase g God. So the word divine literally means it could be from any God, from any source. And you're just taking the attributes or the characteristic of whatever God you are giving reverence to. And so just because it says divine nine, you know, so many people will be like, oh, you know, finding the divine and the divine nine, finding the, the heavenly, finding the godly, there is none here. And so it's important for us to know the definition, the definition of divine before we even, you know, launch into all the other things that really show us why these are not from God. At least our God, the God of Abraham, Isaac and Jacob, that's the God we're talking about. Yeah. Oh, that's so good. That is so good. Thank you for that, Ashton. That is so, so good. Um, so that's actually going to transition into my first point that I want us to discuss, which is the perceived benefits. OK, so what are the benefits compared to scripture that lures us into the organizations? And so um, I'm going to I'm going to start if we don't mind. For me, I want to say uh, the brotherhood and the sisterhood is really what lured me into it. Um, I would always see the Greeks on campus that were just so, you know, tightly knit. They were always, you know, line brother this, line sister that, you know, even their pro fights, they were just so close and they just really prided themselves on this brotherhood and the sisterhood. And I know a lot of um, people that I know that didn't have siblings, they wanted to have sisters and brothers. So they would join these organizations to, you know, get that, get that community that they didn't have, you know, I guess on their own. And so what the Lord revealed to me was that in the kingdom of God, we already have a brotherhood and a sisterhood. And so once we join these organizations, essentially what we're doing is we're leaving our brother and sisterhood that's covered by Christ. And we're going into another brother and sisterhood that is covered by the false God. And so the Lord actually led me to Romans um, 8, 14, which says, for all who are being led by the spirit of God are the sons and daughters of God. OK, and it says for all who are being led by the spirit of God are the sons and daughters of God. And so when it comes to these organizations, the Lord revealed that they are not being led by the spirit of God. They are not they are not being led 
by any anything that is of God, they're being led by another God, by another spirit. And so, and when you when you think about it, the Lord also pointed out when you think about um, it's not just it is founded on Christian principles, but it's not just a these organizations are not just exclusive to Christians. So there's Buddhists that are in these organizations. There's Muslims that are in these uh, organizations. There's Jehovah Witnesses that are in these organizations that do not profess Jesus as Lord. And so these organizations can't be founded. They can't really be rooted in God. They can't be rooted in Jesus because Jesus is really not the head of these organizations. And another thing that the Lord pointed out was the, the community service. I know that's something as a president, when I was a president in my chapter, um, I would always say, you know, we do, you know, community service. We love to serve, you know, deltas, you know, love to give back to the community, all of this. But God was saying, but who was getting the credit? Who was being glorified? Yeah. Who who are who is being praised whenever we do this community service? God said it wasn't. It's not me. It's not me. Whenever, whenever we, whenever the Deltas are doing community service, it's it's Delta being glorified. It's Delta being praised. It's Delta that is being esteemed. It's Delta that is becoming popular. That is drawing other people to the organization. The organization is not drawing people to God. They're drawing people to Delta. And so God brought me to Matthew five sixteen, and it says, "In the same way, let your light shine before others." so that they may see your good works and give glory to your father who is in heaven. And so when we do works in these organizations, we are not giving glory to our father who is in heaven. We are giving glory to Delta who is not in heaven. And those, those were the two that I, those were the two that I had. So anybody have anything else they want to add to the conversation? Because that's all I, I go all day, but I just, I just want to get them to you know, if I could chime in, I, I think for a lot of people, myself included, what the allure was for me was the connections, especially after undergrad. Uh, we were told, hey, you have a lifelong brotherhood of brothers who are going to look out for you in corporate world, business, any and everything. Of course, that sounds attractive to an 18 year old, you hmm. know, who wants to be covered and protected. But at the time, you know, my walk with the Lord wasn't that where it should have been. So but if it was strong, I would have been like the Lord is the one who's going to connect me to where I need to be connected to, not rely on man. You know, we're not the trust in, in mankind. You know, we're supposed to trust in God. So that was the big allure for me was the connections after college, you know. Anybody else want to jump in on that one? Yes. Um, like you, a lot of the brotherhood sisterhood definitely um, stood out to me. Um, but two things came up as I was hearing you speaking. The first thing was going back to the root of speaking. Um, and when we look at how... Uh, the Divine Nine or these Greek, uh, Black Greek organizations came from Prince Hall Freemasonry, which came from um, Freemasonry um, abroad from Ireland. We got to remember that it was rooted in pain. We weren't, um, we were at a time where um, a lot of people turned to these organizations instead of um, turning to the Holy Spirit for comfort um, and a way out during a lot of um, racism and all type of things that were going on. And so, uh, anything rooted in pain and not in like freedom, that's already going to have a different foundation than how the, the Lord moves. He doesn't bound uh, things in fear. And so from that, it's also to um, important to remember that that like grief and other things that go on in the organization as well. Mm -hmm. And one of the things that I also think about um, I think for me specifically and other people that I remember, especially in undergrad, was um, this conversation when they were being recruited, whether while that was discreet and those were private conversations that people were having, one of the conversations was about being the leader on campus or being like the big man on campus or being um, seen as better than other people on campus. Basically, you join our organizations and like we're it, we're 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 the thing that you want to be a part of. And when you join us or when you're connected to us, like that's how everybody will view you. And that is how a lot of people viewed viewed um, individuals and organizations on campus, especially the, the Black Greek organizations. And so I, for me, that, while I don't think I actually necessarily said that out loud to people um, or said that in an interview about why I wanted to join, that was appealing 
Um, and I think it was an identity issue, an identity issue for me of who I was. Um, and I needed this organization to affirm that. And so when we talk, when we think about the Bible, when we think about God, because God in the Bible, it talks about sonship and identity. Um, and it talks about how we are adopted um, and we are his heir. We are uh, we have his inheritance because we are heir of Jesus Christ. Um, it talks about that we are uh, co-workers with Jesus Christ as well. And so already, I think Greek organizations, it's for it. It, it's, it um, pulls on individuals who don't know who they are um, and who don't know their identity already in Christ. Um, those people who maybe are weak minded at that moment in college trying to figure out who they are and not being able for me. That's this is who I was to stand on Christ and stand on Christ alone. And that be my identity. Um, I needed something else to affirm me and affirm me around others, even though I, I did believe in Christ as a, a undergrad and I did say that and I did go to church and I did all those things this organization did affirm though like I am that person which is which is completely against God because he already established who we were who we are in Christ um and so that I could see right there that I was already still immature in my belief in college um about my identity in Christ and I think that's a lot of things that many people struggle with even now outside of college just who they are um, in the kingdom. Oh, that's good. That's good, Tori. Ashton, did you have anything you want to add to that? Or Yeah, I want to add, you know, a, a part, a big part of the draw is there's this idea that you will be elite when you join these organizations. Mm -hmm. Think about all the probates or even when talking about the org, it's always, oh, my illustrious organization or my illustrious founder. So there's this concept of gaining this certain level of status and you know, it plays on the struggle of African-Americans who have been, you know, just down in this country. It's been so hard to to rise in economic status, education. So when you see this avenue that's specifically for African-Americans that will give you this elite status, you're going to be a part of the divine nine. You're going to have this network, not even just within your own organization, but it's, it's you know, it's sold to you that all nine organizations are just going to be one big family, which is a lie because even in the chapter that I was on, um, you know, we had Kappas that were fighting with Sigmas on campus over something as stupid as a cane. And it's like, this is supposed to be a family, but you're fighting over something so stupid. But if you went into the workplace, you know, are you going to fight the interviewer because he's a Sigma and you're a Kappa? So that's a whole nother story. But, you know, you just, they sell you on being elite. And the other day when I was walking, the Holy Spirit said to me, why would you want to be in the, the, the divine nine when you can be a part of a royal priesthood? And first Peter two and nine, he says, but you are not like that for you are a chosen people. You are royal priests, a holy nation, God's very own possession. As a result, you can show others the goodness of God for he called you out of the darkness into his wonderful light. And so like Tori was talking, when you are, when you know your identity in Christ, what's more elect than being God's elect? Like what can be more distinct than being a son, a daughter of God? And so these organizations, they play on, you know, our ignorance and they play on the pain and the trauma that the black community has been, you know, just going through for decades and centuries in this country. OK, so when we are lured by these, you know, these perceived benefits that we just addressed, there's the pre-interest or I'm sorry, there's the pre-pledge uh, slash interest phase. OK, and so did anybody want to highlight Anything from that aspect that goes against the word of God? I think all of it, really. It's like, which, what do you want to point on? Um, so, yeah. There's, there's so much pride in it. So, like, for example, mm -hmm. part of the interest process in Kappa, and I'm sure most, most of the orgs, you have to make phone calls. You have to call, you know, it's called, what do they call it? Um, you got to know the lineage of the chapter. You got to know all the lines that came before you. So when you call these people, you have to do your research because you need to know their families. You, know, you need to know their marital status. You need to know their jobs, their interests, what school they went to. You pretty much have to know everything about them. So when you get on the call, you can like make them feel like they are just somebody because somebody knows, oh, this young man has researched me. He knows me. You know, he better come correct when he's on the phone with me. You know, there's sometimes when you call someone who's already in the org and they may even just, they may hang up on your face because they want you to chase them. They want to see if you'll call them again, they want to see how bad do you want it? Um, you know, there's sometimes where you'll call a brother or a sister and it's like, 
before they give you information about the org or about themselves, you have to complete a task. And so it's, you know, the scripture tells us to love one another the way that God has loved us. And this is how they will know you are my disciples by the love you show one another. And so if we're supposed to be found, if these organizations are founded on Christian principles, where is the principle of love? The scripture tells us that love, you know, God is love. There's no love when you're trying to become a part of these organizations. It's just, it's absolutely ridiculous you know, the way that there's so much pride and arrogance at the foundation of these of these organizations. And that's just one, you know, but I'll definitely open up the floor for everybody else. Yeah, that's good. Um, one thing that the Lord brought to my um, remembrance is how we have to work to be accepted. So during the interest phase, the pre-pledge phase, we are essentially working for our acceptance into these organizations. And so you cannot become a part of an organization unless you put in some type of work. You got to put in, whether it's like a phone call, like you said, Ashton, whether it's running errands, going to events, speaking to all of the, you know, Deltas or the Alphas, whoever, whatever you're trying to be a part of, you have to speak to them. You know, you have to bow down to them. You have to, you know, kind of give reverence to them, you know, and put them on a pedestal because you want to be where they are. And so one thing that the Lord was pointing out is um, like Chelsea said in her video, like works can't save you. Like when it comes to the kingdom, we don't, we don't even have to work for our salvation. So why should we have to work to be accepted into this organization? And so the Lord brought me to Ephesians 2, 8. It says, by, for by grace, you have been saved through faith. Okay. Faith in Christ. And this is not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not as a result of works so that no one may boast. And so what ends up happening is because we do work to get into these organizations, we do become boastful when we cross into these organizations. We become boastful. We become prideful. We become arrogant because we have worked to earn this um, this membership. We put in the work. It's all I, I, I. And that is why we boast. But when it comes to salvation, it is a gift from God. We can never we can never boast because it's not us. We didn't save ourselves. God saved us. Jesus saved us on the cross. And so it's just such a contradiction when it comes to working for the organizations when we don't even have to work to be with our father in heaven. Something else I think about is the lying. Um, yes. That's it. Uh, for me, again, I'm going to speak always for me because I think that a lot of people, I, I think that a lot of people right now are looking at those who denounce, this is like going off topic, but coming back to it those people who are renouncing organizations um, as that we're condemning and others and that we're not walking in love basically. But for me, like that's why I always talk about my testimony and my experience because it is love. Like love cancels a multitude of sins. I'm loving you as my brother and sister in Christ or not even if you're an unbeliever, I'm loving you by telling you, you know, what I have to go through and what God revealed in hopes that that helps you. So I do want to just kind of make that caveat because I, I've experienced that thus far in this journey after denouncing of um, people feeling like I'm being condemning to them um, and judging them for still being in the organizations and things like that. So I hope that this conversation really does help people to see that it really is about God. It's not about us um, who are talking right now. It's about Jesus. So for me, the lying um, and the deception was a big thing. And I go back to Proverbs 12 and 22 that says the Lord detests, but he delights in people who are trustworthy. We have to, I'm sure everybody on this call and, and many other people watching, we have to lie. I had to lie. I started lying even before I was officially a part of um, the pre-pledge process. So just lying to express my interest in a way that other people wouldn't know that I was interested, um, lying to my parents, lying to uh, teachers or other people around me about, oh, no, I'm fine. Like, I'm not going through anything. Like, I'm just having a rough time with this. Or really, it was it was all this other stuff that I was being required to do. And just constantly, every day, I feel like it was a lie. Every day there was lying that was happening. And then when you when we go back to, you know, how we ask for repentance and we ask God for forgiveness for things, when we ask God for forgiveness for our sins, we supposed to turn away. Like we have to try to turn away. We have to make an effort. And so in the midst of me doing that, I still wasn't making an effort because 
the organization, that process wouldn't allow me to do that. And it was for me, that was more important than turning away from lying and turning away from that sin specifically. Yeah, that's good. That's one thing that the Lord highlighted, like in the beginning is how like lying is a serious offense to him. And I don't think people really understand that lying is really a big deal to him because I know I was a habitual liar. Like I lied like it wasn't nothing because to me it wasn't nothing. Like it was just a lie. But to God, he says it's an abomination. Mm -hmm. Like it really says that. And so also because Tori, you mentioned Proverbs 22, uh, 12, 22. I have that one written down. And I also have Proverbs 19, 9. It says a false witness shall not shall not be unpunished. And he that speaketh lies shall perish. Mm -hmm. And then Psalm 101, 101 7 says, No one who practices deceit shall, shall dwell. Let me start over. Psalms 101 7 says, No one who practices deceit shall dwell in my house. No one who utters lies shall continue before my eyes. So these scriptures really just explain how offensive lying is to God. And lying, honestly, I would even put it down as a, it was a requirement. Like it was a requirement to lie under the heading of being discreet. Under, under, you know, it was kind of masked as being discreet, but when it's actually just, it's really lying. It's really lying. And it is something that the Lord um, is not happy with. The Lord is displeased with. And also I think about how there's this blanket blanket phrase that I always would say as a past president is that we are a non-hazing organization. That is a that is a bold faced lie. That is a I, I would say at every event and lying every event, knowing at the end of that event, I'm going to have somebody call me that night. Knowing in the back of my mind, I already knew somebody was going. I was going to haze somebody, but I stood in front of everybody and said, "Oh, Delta Sigma Theta is a non-hazing organization. We're founded on Christian principles. All of this that is a lie. Delta does haze. Alpha does haze. Kappa does haze. Phi Beta Sigma does haze. AKA does haze. Everybody haze, okay? But there is this blanket statement that is a lie. That is a non-hazing organization just to make it appear." as if there's no hazing going on when it really is hazing. There is pledging. You do have to get down to be accepted into these organizations. Now you can not be down, but you ain't gonna get respected. If you want the respect, if you want the honor, if you want to feel like you're actually a member, you have to haze, you have to pledge, okay? Anybody else got something they wanna say? Ooh, yeah, no. to piggyback on what Lala and Tori said about the lie, what a lot of people don't realize is when they begin the pledge process, they're actually beginning a, a starting to live a double life. Mm -hmm. We know what James 1, 7 says about a double minded man. They're unstable in all their ways. Like Lala just said, you know, oh, no, we don't haze. But that night you're going to go haze someone who's pledging. Mm -hmm. And we know how the Lord feels about double mindedness, living mm -hmm. double lives. There's this lies and deception, you know, and, and there's no way that a, a person who professes Christ can continue in, in an organization like that, thinking that, oh, I'm good with the Lord. No, you're not. You're living a double life. A double-minded person is unstable in all their ways, you know? So I want to add also, so I, don't, I don't even remember the, like the, the, the title of this subject that we're on right now, but when I think about John 1 and 12, so, you know, because these organizations, they're so elite, quote unquote, they're exclusive. People are excluded from these organizations. You could have all the money. You could have the, you know, the fee. First of all, let's talk about the outrageous fees to get into these organizations after you're accepted. But you could have the top recommendations. But yet, if somebody in that chapter doesn't like you for a personal reason, say if you have a beef with a brother or a sister in the org, you could be the perfect candidate for what they're looking for on paper and still not get in just because at the end of the day, you know, the chapter has to vote whether or not you're even allowed to get online. And so, you know, there's there's a chance that you may not be accepted into these organizations that are quote unquote based on Christian principles. Mm -hmm. The Christian principles, the basis of the Christian principles says John 1 and 12, but to all who believed in him and accepted him, he gave the right to become children of children of God. So we all have the right to everybody has the right, the privilege, the opportunity to become a child of God and all you have to do is believe. But in order to even have a chance to have a shot at becoming a part of a demonic organization, you have to be this elite candidate and you already have to have, sometimes you already have to be plugged in. You know, you have to be what I'm 
quote unquote, what they call a legacy, which is when your parent is a part of this organization. And it's crazy that we call that a legacy because the legacy is something great that you pass on from one generation to the next. So the scripture tells us a good man leaves an inheritance or a legacy to his children. We should be leaving a legacy of faith. And yet we call it a legacy to be in a demonic organization. Like it's, it's just so crazy how intertwined and how much if you said we could sit here and we could talk all night and we still wouldn't uncover all the truths, you know, that God reveals about what's wrong with these organizations. But yeah. That just stands out to me a lot. It's just how some people are not picked just because of, you know, personal issues. It could be, I don't like your hair. Mm-hmm. If I don't like you, if a brother doesn't like you, you're not getting it. Yeah. I actually want to touch on that really quick because it mm-hmm. still touches with lying. It connects to lying, what Ashton's saying about the little things that could cause you not to get picked. And I think about Proverbs 16, 28, a perverse person stirs up conflict and gossip separates close friends. And so for me, I was the perverse person in the chapter as well as other people. But like I remember during those times that it was time to um, try to find new people or we were saying we had interests and we had individuals who we knew we wanted, but we knew their friends wanted to be in it, too. So we told them, go get pictures, go get stuff on your friends. You need to tell us about them so that we can if they show up to our um, intake process, the the official one, um, we can we can write why we don't we don't want them. We can show proof of why. So again, it's it's you're starting up this starting up conflict amongst friends to try to control who gets in, who doesn't get in, to lie basically to, to lie about them. Um, pictures of people at parties that we all were at parties and we all were doing things that we shouldn't have doing been doing. So lying in the, in the, on that in that moment about that one person and showing them in a negative light, it was it, it was really bad. But that's what again these organizations cause um, the conflict amongst friends, um, especially when individuals don't get in and others do. But also it caused the lies and the deceptions and manipulation amongst people who are supposed to be friends, but then they decide to do something to their other friends so that they can get into an organization. Yeah, if I could jump in, um, this is one thing that Satan likes to use to cause division and strife. James 3.16 says, for where envying and strife is, there is confusion in every evil work. Satan likes to, God doesn't have any favorites, obviously. He shows no favoritism. Satan uses favoritism to to put others, pit people against each other, get people in depression, get people in, in envy. See, the difference between envy and jealousy is envy will make someone kill someone for something. And jealousy covets, but envy wants to hurt someone because they have what you want. And and these seeds are sown in some of these or in these organizations because oh we don't want we don't like that person so we're not gonna let them in. I remember an undergrad. There was a friend of mine. She didn't get into a particular story into AKA, and she was distraught, just depressed for whatever reason. They didn't pick her, and I was like, wow, it's not the end of the world. But but you know. Being a young person, being 18, 19 years old, you don't think about that. You just think about being with the in crowd. The enemy knows this. Satan knows this. And he uses it to put people in bondage, put people in depression because they didn't get picked by a group. Whereas the Lord says, like Ashton was mentioned earlier, hey, salvation is free to all. Believe. And so um, once we go through everything that we just mentioned in the pre-pledging process and the interest phase, then we get to the actual um point of where we ex- we're accepted, right? We make line. And so there's the the pledging process, which is consisted of an underground process. And in some chapters, there is, I'm sorry, the, the above ground, sorry, it's consisted of the above ground process for, for all the chapters. And then there's the underground process for, you know, some chapters that do have an underground process. And so um, first, I want us to touch on the above ground process. Okay. And so any of the rituals that are against the word of God. And so if we don't, if we don't mind, I want to, can I pop that thing off with um, excerpts from the Delta Sigma Theta Sorority Incorporated ritual, which says, so this is the initiation ritual. Okay. And so the president, I'm going to jump down to the bottom where she, where she says, do you of your own free will and accord seek admission into Delta Sigma Theta Sorority Incorporated? And so the candidates say, I do. Okay. Then the president says, you seek of your own free will admission to our sisterhood and we agree to accept you. 
She says, you are about to take upon yourself vows and obligations from which you can never be freed. They will follow you to the final judgment. I charge you that you approach with serious minds as we do now proceed. And then she says, Delta, Delta Sigma Theta is a glorious international sisterhood. If there are any sorors present or not present toward who you cannot have a feeling of kinship and devotion, to whom you cannot pledge true loyalty and sisterly attitudes, I charge you here and now to withdraw. And so we say, I do not wish to withdraw, okay? And so I want to highlight the fact that it says, you are about to take upon yourself vows and obligations from which you can never be freed. They will follow you to final judgment, okay? And so when it comes to 2 Corinthians 5, 2 Corinthians 5, 11, 5, 10, sorry, it says, for we must appear before the judgment seat of Christ so that each of us may receive what is due what is due to us for the things done in the body, whether good or bad, okay? And so whew, the Lord pointed out that in the Delta ritual, okay, they tell us, hey, this is something serious. This is going to follow you to find a judgment. So please uh, process what you're about to accept. OK, but because we do this process, we do this ritual the day we probate. So we did this ritual the morning we probated and then we probated that evening. So nobody is listening to exactly what she is saying. All we hear is da 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 da. I do da 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 da. I do because we are ready to turn up at our probate. We are ready to to officially become deltas because we've been online for eight weeks and one day. So we are really trying to get into this organization. We don't care what this lady is talking about. And so that is so strategic of Satan to put that right before he know we at the finish line. And so, but when you backtrack and you you actually read through this with sound mind and you see that it's, it's already here. It's saying that these are obligations for which you can never be free. And why does it mention final judgment? Because it says we must appear before the judgment seat of Christ and we are going to receive what is due for the things that are done in the body, whether good or bad. Okay, and so the Lord is saying that when, when it comes to the, these organizations, it says it in the ritual that we are going to have to answer for joining this organization that is not of God. Okay, we've, we've taken these vows, these obligations, we've committed ourselves. And it says here, it says you can never be freed from these vows and obligations. So everything that you agree to is going to stay with you until you, until you, until you face Christ and have to answer to why you decided to join an organization that is against him. And so the Lord pointed that out and I was just, I was done. I was really done. I was really done. And so another part of the ritual, it says, at, in the beginning, it says, um, when, before, as they, as they start the meeting, it says, the president says, will the meeting please come to order? Sergeant at arms, are we free for, are we free from intrusion? And the sergeant at arms says, worthy president, we are free from intrusion. Intrusion. I can't. I don't know why I can't say intrusion. <laughs> and then the president says, "I light the torch of wisdom." Okay. Then the vice president says, "Our motto is intelligence is the torch of wisdom. Behold the torch of wisdom." And so she lights the 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 torch of wisdom, which is essentially a red candle that is on the the table, which is an altar. Okay. We it looks like a table, but it's actually an altar. And then the vice president says, this, "So basically, she says this candle." burns, not candle, but this torch burns whenever Delta women are assembled. Let me start over. It says, it burns whenever Delta women are assembled and guides our footsteps as we work in the name of the sorority. And then it goes on to say, as college educated women holding a torch aloof, we, um, we are trained into an intellect towards the advancement of intellectual, social, spiritual pursuits of the service of mankind. Okay, I want to highlight 
It burns whenever Delta women are assembled and guides our footsteps as we work in the name of the sorority. And so the, the torch of wisdom is connected to the goddess Minerva. Okay, and so the so Minerva is the goddess that is on top of the Delta shield. There's a lady head on top of the Delta shield, and that is Minerva. Okay, and so she is the goddess of wisdom, justice, and law. So this ritual says that Minerva's wisdom burns whenever Delta women are assembled and guides our footsteps as we work in the name of the sorority. Okay. And so God led me to last night, Isaiah 31. It says, woe to the rebellious children, declares the Lord, who um, execute a plan, but not mine, and who make an allegiance, but not of my spirit, in order to add sin to sin. Okay, woe to the rebellious children, declares the Lord, who execute a plan, but not mine, and who make allegiance, but not of my spirit. OK, not of my spirit. OK, and so this is saying the spirit of Minerva burns whenever Delta women are assembled and guides our footsteps as we work in the name of the sorority. It is not saying the Holy Spirit burns whenever Delta women are assemb assembled. It's not saying God burns whenever it ain't even saying Jesus burns whenever Delta women are assembled. So this organization is not rooted in God. It's rooted in Minerva because wherever the deltas are, Minerva is. God is not there. Okay. According to Isaiah 30, that is, we're rebellious. His children are rebellious because we are making an allegiance, not of his spirit. So Lala and I, we talked about some of the Kappa rituals in the last video, so I won't repeat it too much, but you know, in, in the rituals of Kappa Alpha Psi, it dictates that new members you must bow at the sacred delphine shrine and it says the altar of kappa in those rituals it says the altar of kappa alpha psi is the sacred delphic shrine the delphic shrine is located in the temple of where apollo is worshipped and so right there it's telling you that the altar of kappa, kappa alpha psi is synonymously an altar unto the greek god apollo so i mean what more do you even need to know? You know, if we're being led by the Holy Spirit, why would I be bowing at an altar to anyone other than the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob? But I just want to read some of the lyrics because after you've done, you know, the rituals, you have to sing the Kappa Alpha Psi hymn to kind of like seal the deal. And first of all, like, why does this an organ hymns? If you know the old church, like there were hymns of the church, and that's what we did to, you know, to join together in worship. And so let me just read some of the lyrics. It says, O noble Kappa Alpha Psi, the pride of all our hearts, true manliness, fidelity, thou ever dost impart, the source of our delights and joys and happiness thou art. O noble Kappa Alpha Psi, from thee we will never part. And then it says, I'll just read the ending. It says, when all our student days are gone and we from school must go, Still, we will honor, love, and sing thy praises over and over. We will live for thee. We will strive for thee. We'll all thy ways adore. We will long for thee and toil until we reach the golden shore. Like, what? We're, why would we be saying any of this to an entity that's not God? It's saying we're going to honor Kappa. We're going to love Kappa. We're going to sing praises unto Kappa. We're going to long. So it's we're literally prophesying over ourselves. We're declaring that my heart, my soul is going to long for thee. This thee is talking about Kappa. So Kappa, I'm going to long for you. I'm going to toil. We have believers in the church who won't even sign up to serve or volunteer, but we're declaring that I'm going to serve Kappa until I reach the golden shore. And so the golden shore is like a place where Kappas say that, you know, when you die, that your soul, or they don't say soul, they say you're diamond which is really like when they say your diamond, it means your heart and your soul. So your diamond is going to rest on the golden shore. And so whenever a member of Kappa Alpha Psi passes away, there's even secret rituals that you do at a funeral. It's like you have a closed service. That's just, it's ridiculous to think that at a funeral, you're going to leave the family and you and your brothers are just going to go do some secret weird rituals at a funeral because you want their soul to be resting at the golden shore. And they call it, so when a brother passes, they say that he's gone to chapter invisible. 
Like I don't want to. I don't want to be in no chapter invisible. No, I don't want to be at a golden shore. I want to be at early gates, and that's the only place I want my soul resting when I leave this earth. But it's just like I remember when I was going through the process. I couldn't even get through this song without laughing. Like me and one of my former line brothers, we would literally be in there like holding our breath, trying to bite our tongues, not to laugh while singing the song because it was just so like some of these brothers really get into it. Like they are really singing this song and they really feel the lyrics. And I'm sitting there like, yo, this it feels cultish. It feels weird. It like we're all standing up in a circle sometimes holding hands. And, you know, at Founders Day events, you sing this song and then. At a Founders Day event, you would sing this hymn, and in the middle of the room, it's like a big diamond with, um, you know, candles as lights, and then the faces of the founders are going down the four sides of the diamond. And so it's just so weird to think of like a bunch of grown men singing around singing this song. So I had a problem then, and I wasn't even filled with the Holy Spirit at this point, but I already could see in my mind like, yeah, this is this is something wrong. But again, you know, it was just one of those things that I overlooked. Because I was like, it's whatever, you know, there's a greater picture. I'm just going to, I'll just charge it to the game really is what we used to say. Like, you know, there's just some things we'll look over. I like that um, Ashton mentioned the altars. Because uh, for me, like I said, like one of the biggest parts of AK was, is that pledge that I think is just really, really bad. As well as the hymns, um, because that really removes Christ's name and then enters AKA. But another thing that I, I really wish people would, I want people to understand, and I wish more believers would spend time in their Bible, and they can, especially after this, as you hear, God is very serious about covenants, altars, and oaths. Um, since the beginning of time, especially with altars, like we, there, God asks for his people to, to do sacrifices to him. The devil, as cunning as he is, he he's an imitator. And so he imitates and mocks everything. So now you think about the altars and what God says in the Bible about altars and making sacrifices to him, especially in the Old Testament. And now in the New Testament, we are, you know, we are the sacrifices as who we are um, in Christ in our bodies and um, as believers. But especially in the Old Testament with those altars, that's one thing that now the enemy has created in these organizations and has manipulated where now we have built altars to other gods, um, covenants. We're making covenants to other gods. God, there's so many covenants in the Bible that God talks about between his people, um, the Abrahamic covenant, the Noahic, Noahic covenant, covenant. There's all of these covenants in the Bible. So God is very serious about binding agreements. And he actually recognizes covenants that we don't make with him. So that's how serious he is about it. Um, there's a scripture that is in Joshua 23, 16. When you tran transgress the covenant of the Lord, your God, which he commanded you, and go and serve other gods and bow down to them, then the anger of the Lord will burn against you and you will perish quickly from off the good land which he has given you. So again, understanding what God, what covenants, how how important covenants are to God. And so when we think about everybody's ritual, it's a covenant. It's an agreement that we're making. It's a, a binding contract that we're making with a, another entity, a deity, a thing that is not God. And then the last thing would be the oaths, the swearing and um, kind of what Lala was talking about at the end of uh, the Delta the Delta ritual at the end of the AKA ritual for sure. And Matthew 5, 33 talks about do not swear an oath at all, either by heaven for it is God throne or by earth for it is his footstool. And that scripture goes on to even explain further about oaths. So for me, that's like the biggest thing that also that I've really been processing is rituals and altars and covenants in these Greek organizations. Like people can just do a deep dive on what that really means because that's the spiritual part that a lot of believers miss. Um, and, and they don't really think about it fully in its entirety. And that's really what offends God the most um, are, is the fact that the enemy has been able to blindly lead people into making covenants with false gods, taking oaths and building altars continuously. Even if you're not in that, if you're inactive, um, if you haven't renounced, you have a covenant. Like it's a binding agreement that still exists. Just like we talk about spirits that are hidden inside of us, things that 
you know, we need deliverance from that we may not even realize. Like, that's what that is. Even if you're inactive and you have no connection to the organization, if you haven't made that realization and if Christ hasn't revealed it to you or if your heart is hardened right now and you can't see it, there's no way that you're released from it. You're not delivered from it yet. Like, it's still connected. And so I think that that's what I really want people to start to understand and talk, start to take serious. We don't even take serious the marriage, the covenant of marriage. And don't get me started on that. But <laughs> some of us don't. Um, however, so now I even think about that. Some of us like are are so strong in the covenant to these organizations, and we may have got into a divorce and all this other stuff, or you know, committed adultery. But we're like strong for for these these organizations and the covenants that we we built or we made. If I could piggyback on what Tori said, uh, there's a verse I shared with you all earlier. It's Deuteronomy uh, 32, 16. It's coming from the Amplified. They provoked him to jealousy with strange gods by denying him the honor and loyalty that is rightfully and uniquely his. And with repulsive acts, they provoked him to anger. They sacrificed to demons, not to God. This is the Old Testament, mind you. You're already talking about demons in the Old Testament, all right? To gods whom they have not known, new gods who came lately, whom your fathers never feared. You were unmindful of the rock who bore you, and you forgot the God who gave you birth. The Lord saw it and rejected them. Out of indignation with his sons and his daughters, then he said, I will hide my face from them. I will see what their end shall be. For they are a perverse generation, sons in whom there is no faithfulness. They have made me jealous with that, made me jealous with what is not God. They have provoked me to anger with their idols. So I will make them jealous with those who are not a people. I'll provoke them to anger with a foolish na nation. And further down, re really quickly in verse 37, and he will say, where are their gods? The rock in which they took refuge, who ate the fat of their sacrifices and drank the wine of their drink offering. Let them rise up and help you. Let them be your hiding place. See now that I, I am he, and there is no God besides me. So right there, that's one of the strongest condemnations from God about idolatry. And what a lot of people in these organizations fail to realize is that, oh, it's just, you know, Greek mythology. No, those are demons because there's no other God but one. Mm -hmm. And if everyone knows, any good Christian should know that Satan, before his fall, he was Lucifer. He got kicked out of heaven for why? He wanted to be God. And the angels who fell with him wanted to be gods. So they can't come out and humanity say, oh, we're, we're demons. We've fallen angels. We want to be gods. So what are we going to do? Create Greek mythology. Roman mythology, African um, uh, ancestry worship, all this stuff to look like the vine, to look like God, but it's not. It's really demons. I was thinking the other day, too, because, again, I think when, when we talk about like this renouncing, I everyone has their own personal opinion you know, about the pledging process, whatever you think it's not. It comes down to the rituals and uh, the covenants with these gods. And I was just thinking about like plain and simple because sometimes people, oh, it's not that big a deal. You know, it's just a Greek God. If I walked into a church, a place of worship, and I saw Minerva on the left side of the chapel, if I saw Apollo on the right side, I saw a big sphinx in the middle. I wouldn't just say, oh, it's no big deal. You know, I'll, I'll still sit here and see what the pastor has to say. I'm gonna still let these people lay hands on me and prophesy. No, I'm walking out of that place of worship. So why, so why is it, why do we just look this over now? Like, Literally, Delta Minerva is right there on the shield. Literally, what the AKA's Atlas is on the shield as well, right? And so I heard, you know, I heard this conversation where a member of AKA was like, "It's just, um, it's just like uh, an analogy of how you know how Atlas is holding up the world. That's what we want to do as AKA's. We want to hold up the good things in the world." I'm just like, you. That's not like, come on now, you you know better. Like you have to know better. You have to discern better. And if not, we, you know, this is why we really have to study the word, not just read the word. We have to study. We have to ask the Lord to reveal things to me. Lord, reveal the things to me that are hard. Reveal things to me that I may not want to give up because, you know, there are things that even though that we've renounced this organization, there may still be things in our lives that are hidden from us that our hearts are not ready to accept. It's a daily process. These aren't just because we've renounced, we're not perfect. And I don't want to go forgive off that perception that we think we are just like believers that have just got it all together now. But this is just one thing that we've been exposed to. So we have to share the truth. 
you know, Ezekiel talks about how he's a watchman and how if he doesn't share what the Lord has told him, that blood will be on his hands. This is not just something that we're doing for fun. We have a responsibility to share the truth that has been shared with us through the Holy Spirit. And it's just wild. Like I said, when I think about walking to a church and I see these Greek gods, I, I already get irritated when I see the letters in the church. So imagine if we saw these big gods just painted on the walls, on the, you know, on the window seals of a church. And I think people forget that like the Greek gods, people, there are Greek, Greek people that live in Greece who believe in these gods. This is their religion. So I think that when people say like, oh, it's just like mythology, it's not to somebody, it's not to them. Even with yoga, and we won't go down that road, but like Hinduism, like that, they're mad at the Western culture for taking their precious religion and precious like movements and creating this westernized yoga that people do. Like there are people who believe in this stuff because it is real to them. So there are people who believe in the Greek Greek gods because it's real to them. Like we know as believers, it is not, but people have to realize you're connecting yourself to something that people feel is sacred and it is what they believe in and it's their religion. Uh, you know, I want to ask a rhetorical question to those who are watching in these organizations who go to church and have Greek days at church. How would, how would you feel if you saw someone wearing a jacket with a pentagram on it or 666 on it? It'll be pretty repulsive, right? So how is wearing Greek letters any different? They're like, well, that's not demonic. That's, you know, ah. Bible says Satan presents himself as an angel of light. Mm -hmm. So, you know, ministries that, that have Greek days, turning their, their synagogues, turning their, their churches into synagogues of Satan and don't even realize it. Or maybe they do and they don't care. That's part of the deception as well. When you're deceived in one area, you deceive in a whole bunch of areas as well. Chelsea, did you have anything you wanted to add to the combo? I I, I was just flowing in the spirit, y'all. Y'all was going. I'm like, they cooking. Let me let them cook. But um, <laughs> as we're talking about uh, pledging, I think the ritual that I would love to highlight, um, the Zeta has been written upon your hearts and minds, and now you're ready to receive the light of Zeta. Like Marcus said, uh, the enemy masquerades as um, an angel of light. And so um, believers, um, we're able to like, like you said, Marcus, recognize outright rebellion with pentagrams and 666, but how he deceives many people, including believers is with them half truths. Those like Lala says often that mix in the profane with the holy. And like that scripture, it was just twisted. They, they removed uh, the law written upon our hearts and minds. They removed how in Philippians four, Jesus guards our hearts and mind. They remove how in Deuteronomy 6, we are supposed to um, uh, love the Lord with all of our heart and our mind and our strength and our muchness and our soul. And it's like, how can you if you're divided? So just putting a little bit in, that's the way that usually seems right to man and it, and it leads to death. It's not just the outright rebellion. It's the little things that add up, that slight something is off, which is why, like you were saying, Ashton, discernment is so important and just... Um, the Holy Spirit is moving and calling us to really walk in step with him. Like he said, a walk, not a run. You need to literally surrender in humility um, each and every day. Like, hey, what do you have for me today to stay in step with the spirit? Because if not, we will be deceived. That's really good. And so after um, for those that not after, but actually during the the above ground process, there is an whole nother ball game of an underground underground process that is actually, you know, as you said, Chelsea, that's cooking underneath while we're doing the above ground. Some um, chapters are doing the uh, underground. I'm getting mixed up. But while we're doing above ground, some chapters are doing underground process. And so um, one of the things that the Lord was pointing out was just that this is abuse. The Lord said that the underground process is mental and physical abuse. And he said, read the definition of abuse. So I'm going to read the definition. And so one definition says uh, to treat a person or an animal with cruelty or violence, especially regularly or repeatedly. OK, another definition says cruel or violent treatment of a person or an animal. 
And so when it comes to abusing children, we view that as wrong. When it comes to abusing your spouse, abusing, you know, uh, somebody you're in a relationship with, just abusing another person, we deem that as wrong as well. But when it comes to these organizations having to get beaten, having to get humiliated, uh, having to be controlled, having to be embarrassed, having to, to go through mental torment, we, these organizations deem that as okay. They deem that as normal. They deem that as accepted. But everything else, children, when we abuse the dogs, we abuse other people, that is something that needs to be punished. That's something that people, you know, you need to go to jail, call the law, like you need to leave. But when it comes to these organizations, no, you, in order to be made, you, you need to stay. OK, and when you stay and you, you are abused for months, OK, because some people are online for months. When you are abused for months, you finally cross and you're celebrated. You finally cross and you are deemed as made. You have, you have earned your, your rights to be in this organization because you've been abused for months and weeks. And so the Lord was just saying like, how, how skewed is that in our thinking? How skewed is that in our view that we deem one thing as abuse and another thing as acceptance, so that we tolerate this and that we celebrate this and God is saying that is just manipulation of what Satan has just been doing to us to make it seem like we have to endure this in order to be accepted into these organizations. When the Lord says, according to Isaiah 53, 5 through 8, it says, but he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was upon him. And with, and with his stripes, we are healed. OK. And so when it comes to Jesus. He took, he took the abuse. He took the punishment. He took all of that for us on the cross. But when it comes to these organizations, we have to take it. We have to take the abuse. We have to take the punishment. And God said, that is, that's, so, that's so backwards. We've already, Jesus has already paid it all for us. Why then do we leave the covering of Jesus to go and have to be beat for another, another God, to be accepted by another God, another organization? And that's all that's all I, that's all the Lord was revealing last night to me. And I was writing it down like, Lord, 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 I don't know. I don't know. Because it really is like a mental. It really is like like a mental like manipulation, because when God called me out and I said, God, I don't understand, like Delta has been nothing but good for me. And so as soon as I said that the Lord flashed me back to the underground process. And so I saw the beatings, I saw the, the profanity, I saw having to eat, drink, all kind of crazy stuff. I saw having to drive off of one hour of sleep. I saw people talking to me crazy. I saw us getting beat with belts. Like I saw all of this, but in my mind at that moment, everything was good. Like everything's good, Lord, what do you mean? Like those have been nothing but good. But the Lord said, did you forget the underground process? Did you forget how you was humiliated, beaten, how you was depressed? Every time the sun went down, I was depressed, started crying. I was sitting on the bed, didn't want to go. Everybody was like, we're going to go. We can't go without the tail. You can't go without the tail, and I don't want to go, but, but I'm going to have to go. Like, I was just out of it. Like, and the Lord was like, you were literally abused, but then you forgot. Like, you forgot all of this abuse. And that's what a lot of people say. Like, we forgot what we did during the underground process. Like it's a type of manipulation that just kind of happens and you just forget everything you went through and you deem these organizations as good and glorious and elitism. There's nothing elite about being abused for your letters. That's not elite at all. That's very sad. It's very sad and, and it's deceptive. The Lord is saying that's very deceptive. And you like you can be you can be glorified, you can be deemed as elite from from man, but from God, you are you are a disgrace to him. You're an abomination to him. He is not pleased with this. He is not celebrating you when you cross them, them burning sands. He is grieved. He is sad. He is hurt. Lala, I have a all that you said right there. Mm -hmm. The verses that came to my mind was this Isaiah 5 and 20. Whoa. Judgment is coming to those who call evil good and good evil, who substitute darkness for light and light for darkness, who substitute bitter for sweet and sweet for bitter. Verse 21. Whoa, judgment is coming to those who are wise in their own eyes and clever and shrewd in their own sight. If that doesn't describe all the organizations, I don't know what what, what does. Again, the beatings. Oh, it's, it's, we got to tear you down to build you up. It's good for you. 
it, it's teaching you strength and perseverance. Perseverance. That was the line. Of it is perseverance. Perseverance. Yeah. Perseverance. Yeah. 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 Perseverance. The 19 jewels of perseverance because we persevered eight weeks in one day by getting beat and talk crazy up. Yeah, that, that was that. That, that. that verse just came to mind when you said all that. So, you know, And it's a lot of hypocrisy because a lot of times people will say, oh, well, these orgs were founded in a time where they were to protect black people from being abused, being raped, being emotionally, spiritually, physically abused from white people. So why of an organization who was supposed to protect black people from doing this, why would we turn around and make black, if I'm going to be beat, I might as well just go let the white people beat me if you're going to come and beat me, you know, beat me again. So what's the, it's so hypocritical. And that's the foundation of this organ. We do not serve a hypocritical God. The scripture says God is not a man that he shall lie. If God says a thing, he does a thing. God is not, Marcus talked about it earlier. God is not double-minded. We do not serve a, a double-minded God. God is not over here. God is not fake. God is truth. And so another thing, a scripture that came to mind is Ephesians 4. Ephesians 4 and 4 says, For there is one body and one spirit, just as you have been called to one glorious hope for the future. And so a lot of believers, you know, and we I haven't been there too. Well, I haven't gotten that conviction yet. We have to stop thinking that just because we are convicted of something that it's not sin. And if the, the Holy Spirit, who is the spirit of truth, so if there is one spirit, there is one spirit of truth. If that one spirit of truth desired to reveal this truth to us, he desires to reveal this truth to all those who have his spirit. There's one spirit. There is one body. So it's not a sin for, you know, half of the believers to be in these orgies. And then it's not OK for the other half. Just God wants all of his children to come out, to come out from among them. The darkness and light have no business being together. And so it's not a it's not a matter of, you know, it's just y'all, if that's how you feel, like y'all, y'all go do your thing. It's that we have to be open, we have to be willing, our hearts have to be open to receive the truth of the Holy Spirit. And a lot of us, we received that conviction, but we didn't want to follow it. We're like, it's you no, know, it ain't that pressing to me, it ain't that serious. Or, you know, I I worked for these letters. That's a big thing. I earned these letters. Earn, not given. Uh, that's another thing, you know, when, you, when you're when you quote unquote made, that's a whole other topic in itself, but you say earn not giving. So you don't want to give up something that was earned. But why would you not, why would you not want to give up something that you had to earn for something that is freely given? Salvation is freely, I don't have to earn salvation. I can never earn my salvation. It's been freely given to me. So I'm going to lay down this, I'm going to lay down my cross and I'm going to pick up the gift that's been freely given as opposed to this demonic gift that's only going to eat me up from the inside. It's going to so there are people who have PTSD, not from the army, not from the military, but from pledging. I remember, and this is a little off topic, but I remember the first time I got offline and I tried to eat eggs. I was like, I don't even want to look at eggs anymore because of you know the egg, the egg pass that you have to do while you're online. And there are a lot of uh, there are a lot worse things that people are traumatized from. People have scars on their body from pledging. You know, it's it's a really the whole process is demonic. It's darkness. It's wicked. It is not from God. I promise you the angels are not up in heaven pledging each other. They do not have line names. They are not organizations. This is not from God. One thing really quick, um, a lot of these organizations in their, either in their, you know, descriptions or in their rituals, they have some mention of them being light. I know one of the handbooks for, for Sigma is Sigma Light, um, but there is mention of light in these organizations. But Luke 11, 34 says this, Jesus is saying in 34, I'm sorry, your eye is like a lamp that provides light for your body. When your eye is healthy, your whole body is filled with light. But when it is unhealthy, your body is filled with darkness. Verse 35, make sure that the light you think you have is not actually darkness. Make sure that the light you think you have is not actually darkness. I mean, when I saw that in that translate, I was like, whoa, a lot of people who think they're saved in these organizations they're cool with Jesus. I see some of these uh, these license plate tags. Uh, I saw one actually not too long ago. It said AKA on the top and it said in Christ at the bottom. Yeah. You see that one? In Atlanta, in Atlanta, we see a lot of those. Um, or in Christ. In Christ. I'm like, wow. That's a prime example of this. You know, Make sure the light you think you have is not actually darkness. They think they're in light, but no, you're in darkness because you're pledged to a false god. In Christ, in idolatry, and in Christ, how is that even possible? 
Yeah, that's good. I was thinking about um, the, so I'm not going to go into like pledging that much because I feel like I did it a lot in my video. And I think some people missed the point. That's why I really touched on those rituals and that covenant and those oaths. Um, but I do want to talk about the beating though. Um, and the glory that people like feel or like, like we talked about already, like the pride that people feel because they got beat. And I think about the apostles when um, they were doing mar after God has got it left. I think it was after Pentecost. Um, they were doing miracle signs and wonders in the name of Jesus. And the Sadducees and the Pharisees came together because they were like, all these people are talking about this Jesus and saying the name of Jesus. And so they brought the apostles in, they put them in prison. The angel came, they got out of prison. The whole story is great. Go, go read Acts 5. Um, but the verse starting at Acts 5, verse 40, it reads, um, so the, they were talking, the, the Pharisees, the priests, they were, they were all talking about what do we do with these apostles? Because they keep saying Jesus in the name of Jesus. And we don't want them to keep saying this Jesus person because it's taken over all the people and all the people are saying it. So after somebody said, well, I don't really know if we should do what you all are talking about, because this could be true. Like you might even be found opposing God. So the next part of the verse talks about, so they took his advice and when they had called in the apostles, they beat them and charged them not to speak in the name of Jesus and let them go. Then they left the presence of the council, rejoicing that they were counted worthy to suffer dishonor for the name. So again, the enemy and how cunning he is and how he mocks and imitates things. The apostles were rejoicing because they were beating for what they were supposed to be doing, which is speaking the name of Jesus, evangelizing, doing miracles, signs and wonders in the name of Jesus. And now we think about the organizations where we're glorifying ourselves because we're getting beaten for the org. We're not even... We're not even getting beaten in the name of Jesus. These Christian organizations, there's nothing to do with Jesus. That these this these beatings, this taking wood, that has nothing to do with the name of um, Jesus. That has nothing to do with Christ. That has nothing to do with evangelism. It has nothing to do with any of that. But when we go back to the apostles and how they rejoiced, because God had already told us, and Jesus has already told us, like we will suffer for His name. Some of us may never like be like persecuted or beaten in our lifetime for God, but there will be other things that happen to us because of who God has called us to be. And he has already told us that like this walk as a believer is not easy and it won't be easy. It's not supposed to be easy. Um, but that's how, you know, God gets the glory. And so I think about that when we talk about the hazing from a beating perspective during the pledging process. So once we, you know, are essentially made for some, for some people, some people just, you know, cross into the organization. There's no underground. There is the um, we're actually a part of the, the sisterhood and the brotherhood. And so um, I want to open up because I, I can start, but I'm opening it up. So like what are some aspects um, after crossing that are against God? I'd say for some of the social ones, at least were <laughs> the chance disrespecting other organizations. Uh, I mean, none of them could be repeated, obviously. Uh, it, looking back back then, it was fun, ha, 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 you know, all that stuff. But now it's kind of like, oh, my gosh, can't believe I you know, said that, you know? And especially being one to say, oh, I'm a Christian on top of that. You know, that's not very Christ-like at all, some of those chants. You know, Ashton, you know, you know, against all organizations, yeah, mainly the fraternities, not really saying anything about the sororities, but... It was like, wow, this is a Christian organization, but we're cussing, you know, against, you know, other, you know, people made in the image of God, you know, and that's one aspect, of course, the parties and drunkenness and, and whatever, you know, that's that, you know, that's part of that. Some of it is promoted, some of it's not, uh, but it's it's a lot of the stuff, the social aspects of it that are not Christ-like or, or, you know, that'll make an organization known as a Christian organization as stated for some of these. Uh, I'll add, so a lot of the, you know, a lot of post-pledging life, I just want to say it is a lot of choice. 
So none of these things are really forced upon you because a lot of the response is, oh, well, nobody made you do it. No, yeah, nobody makes you do this, but it's what these organizations give you access to. You have access to so many things. You have access to a lot of lust, a lot of, like Marcus said, a lot of drunkenness. And so, you know, what does the Bible say? It talks about, you know, if you're, if your left or right hand is getting you in trouble, chop it off. And so if this org is always getting me in trouble, then I need to chop it off. And that's what we do by renouncing. And so again, you know, these orgs, they get the, the parties in itself, not just the lust, not just the drunkenness, but it promotes such pride. It's like, you know, come spend the night with the alphas, come spend the night with the kappas, or, um, you know, come spend the night with the pretty girls, or come spend the night, you know, with the finer women. It's all about, there's so much pride. There's so much pride in what these, um, what these organizations do. And even the things that are supposed to be good things, like, you know, the community service, we talked about how, um, you know, it's all done in the name of these organizations, but even the money, the, that money to me is like blood money pretty much because it's not coming from a good cause. And Lala, I know you and I talked offline one time about, let me see if I can find it. There's a scripture in Matthew 27, um, you know, after Judas had betrayed Jesus, he wanted to give this money back to the people because he was like, I don't even want this money anymore. This money is blood money. They wouldn't even accept the money because they understood that that money was blood money. And they were like, this money cannot be used to do good things because it comes from a wicked cause. And so even though these organizations, they think that they're doing all this stuff, you, you they, that money is not good money. That money is blood money because it's coming from these prideful events. So yes, God can do good things because God can do anything. He can turn anything into good. But the root of that of the community service is all pride. There's even times where after you do a community service event, you're asking the people, hey, can you write me a letter stating what we did, stating how long we were here so that I can go submit that to nationals so that my chapter can win chapter of the year so that we can be known for community service. So it's all pride. I like that you, um, Ashton mentioned the uh, blood money because after I denounced one of my mom's um, best friends, she she sent me a message and it was so funny because she likened it to like drug drug dealers giving money to the church. And I thought that was so funny because I never thought about that. She, she said, you know, I can understand um, the, the organizations do so much good, but I do understand your stance, Tori. I guess it's like when drug dealers are in the community, especially back in the day, because there was times where um, I hear from like um, older people, drug dealers respected the church so much that they would, or, and people in general in neighborhoods, they would turn down their music when they passed a church. Like they would not do certain stuff around the church, but now it's, the world is just different. But she said, you know, when drug dealers come to church and they give up their tithes and they give money and, you know, pastors take all this money for the building fund or for something else from these individuals who are actually really getting money off the, the backs of people who are, you know, who are addicted to drugs, who are dying, all this stuff that's happening. And I was just like, wow, I never thought about that part. So when you said it, Ashton, that's what it made me think of, because I had never thought about the money aspect um, of what these organizations do in the community and, and where that money really comes from and what it really means. And then um, the only other thing that I realized or I thought about is um, the scripture uh, first Peter five and eight, be alert and of sober mind. Your enemy, the devil prowls around like a roaring lion looking for someone to devour. And I, that just goes back to like the alcohol and, and a lot of other things that really cause us to not have a sober mind because it's not just drinking and drunkenness, but it's funny because people will say like, well, all college students partied and um, all people were doing that. But when I was a college student, even before I was in Greek life, I was looking to the Greeks to have those parties. Like that, those were the people who were having those parties. Those were the people, the groups that we wanted to go to those parties for. Not a lot of people had individual parties themselves. If they did, that was fine. But there was also a Greek party happening maybe afterwards or during that same weekend. And it's even the same thing that I saw as an um, international leader in the organization at conferences, there was after parties, there was um, suites, the president's suite and people had were drinking and there were grown women and grown men who were getting drunk. So it's not just college. Um, so again, thinking about that scripture of being a sober mind, there's so many um, gateways and doors we open when we can't 
think clearly um, when we're doing things and we're opening up ourselves to things. So we, we don't have that discernment that Ashton was talking about. Um, and one thing that the Lord pointed out last night is just that there's um, so much sin that's running rampant, like once you cross. And I think, you know, like when we cross, we kind of joke like, you know, like our the number of people we had sex with just like shot up. We called it like Delta numbers or whatever. I don't remember what we called it, but it was just something like where it was like once we cross, like we just started having sex like crazy that our number, our bodies like tripled or whatever they would say. And so but that was like the conversation wasn't to be ashamed of it. The conversation was just to be like, this is normal. Like when you cross, you're going to have all this access to these guys and all of this. And so of course you're going to have, you know, sex with more people. And we, I guess we never really just looked at it as this is bad. Like this is something that we shouldn't even be glorifying and we should, you know, even be talking about like, but it was an ongoing conversation. And so the Lord pointed out that sexual immorality. So Galatians 5, 19 through 21 talks about the works of the flesh, which is so evident in these organizations, which is sexual immorality, impurity, lustful pleasures, idolatry, idolatry, sorcery, hostility, quarreling, jealousy, dissension, division, envy, drunkenness, and wild parties. And in, in, um, at the end, it says, will not inherit the kingdom of God. And so I know everything that I mentioned, I witnessed when I crossed into these organizations, especially the quarreling. Like we say that it's a sisterhood and a brotherhood and we're just supposed to be all a part of this big family. But there's so much quarreling, even on the line, there's quarreling, even between the lines, there's quarreling, even between the organizations. Um, there's a lot of, of quarreling, a lot of arguing, a lot of division that is going on that is just running rampant. The sexual immorality, like I mentioned, is, is running rampant. And God said, but these none of these none of these are evident of the fruit of the spirit. There's no where's the love? Where's the joy, the peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness and self-control. The Lord said, if this is if these organizations are founded on Christian principles, then why are why is this spirit? Why is the fruit of the spirit, excuse me, not evident in these organizations? You mostly see the works of the flesh that is evident versus the fruit of the spirit of God. When you think about the drunkenness, you think about how we all like they even have we have the alcohol that's named after like each org has their own like alcohol. You got the Delta Punch, you got the Nuke Juice, you know, you got the Omega Oil, like like that's the alcohol. Like those are the drinks. Like like when you come to a Delta the Punch, Centaur Piss. Who wants to drink piss? <laughs> so what? What is that? I ain't never heard of this. I always. Oh, Iotas. Yeah. See, like, that's the thing, though. That That's a thing that just shows how much the drunkenness actually runs rampant in these organizations. Like, people actually come looking for the oil. They come looking for the new juice. They come looking for the Delta Punch. Like, because that is what these organizations are known to have is alcohol. It's alcohol. It's, it's, the, it's, the, it's the sex. It's the, the music and all of this. Like, that's what's attributed to these organizations. Another thing I wanted to point out, Lala, is so we talk about, you know, post life after you cross. So there's it's almost like you become disciples of your org now because now you're out. Even though they say you're not recruiting because all these orgs want to brag about like, oh, we don't need to recruit. You're out there advocating for your organization. You are you are a disciple. You are trying to make disciples. And I especially think about how they're they are. These orgs pretty much groom children to be prepared when they get to college. So. In Kappa, there is what they call Kappa League. And so it's like, you know, for middle middle school and high school students, they get hang around the Kappas, they do career fairs, and there's pretty much getting them ready so that if they were to go to a university, they can put on their resume, you know, I did Kappa League, they already vetted me as a good candidate. So it's almost like, you know, you're a legacy. And so the scripture says, Matthew 18 says, but if you cause one of these little ones who trust in me to fall into sin, it would be better for you to have a large millstone tied around your neck and be drowned in the depths of the sea. And so while we're out here, we're thinking, oh, you know, I'm making these boys ready. I'm getting these, you know, these girls ready. It'd be better for us to tire a big rock around our neck and go jump in the ocean than to be breeding these children to get ready to make demonic oaths, to make demonic covenants, to, to prepare. And I remember we spoke, Lala, how I was a youth leader at my old church. And for me to be telling my students, imagine if I was in there telling them, 
You know, yeah, I want you to bow at the altar of God, but then when you get to college, go bow at the altar of Kappa so you can wear these letters across your chest. It is just terrible to think about the repercussions of what we do. And again, like Marcus said, don't let that, don't let the darkness, don't let that light that you think be light really be darkness. And it's so serious. God is so serious about the influence, the anointing that he gives us as believers. If we don't steward that well, we're out here thinking that we're doing. God has given so many of us the gift of communication, and we should be communicating to these children the gospel instead of teaching them about Delta and Alpha and Kappa and all this other stuff. So that's another thing that you know we have to be so careful about. We talk about post-pledging life. That is one of the things that these organizations really advocate for. And I don't really think there's an understanding of what actually is going on in the spirit realm. I think what keeps coming to mind for me is that this quote unquote Christianity or Christian principles is as Christian as wolves in sheep's clothing. It's rooted in the same Christianity that was used to oppress African American it's in Americans. And it's rooted in that um, because when we have a good, um, understanding of the origin of these things and follow it back to Freemasonry. That was the same Freemasonry that, yes, promoted liberty and equality and peace, but was oppressing us. So why would we want to? And then, um, mind you, they denied access for us to join those um, white organizations at the time. Why would we want to join something to look for those principles if that any of those principles weren't even evident when um, they were in or how they started and have continued it? Okay, so the last piece that um, I wanted us to address is, so, you know, we're in these organizations, we're doing, you know, what these organizations do, and we actually start transitioning into strengthening our relationship with God, okay? And so that is actually like a commonality about people that uh, denounce is when they start to elevate with God, the Lord starts to remove the veil in a lot of different areas. And so one of the main areas for us was the organizations that we were a part of. And so once he removes the veil and we see, you know, what it really is, we decide to denounce. And so there's a, a true cost that comes with denouncing. OK, there's a true call that comes with denouncing. And one of the scriptures that the Lord pointed out was Ephesians 5.11. It says, do not participate in the useless deeds of darkness, but instead even expose them. So when we denounce and we do these videos, we are actually um, in alignment with the word of God. We are supposed to expose. OK, we don't denounce and move on with life. So other people can join these organizations and not know what it really is. We have to denounce and start shining the light on these on this darkness that is going on in these organizations and so that, that is what these videos are about is really just shining a light on the darkness we're following ephesians 5 11 we're exposing the um the useless deeds of darkness so i think about the rich young ruler when jesus you know he was like okay so what do i need to do and jesus told him okay if you've done all that you know if, if you claim that you've kept the law give up everything and if you really want you know if you really want me if you really want to inherit the kingdom give up everything and he couldn't do it and even in matthew yeah matthew 16 24 jesus, then jesus said to his disciples and if, if any of you wants to be my follower you must give up your own way take up your cross and follow me if you try to hang on to your life you will lose it but if you give up your life for my sake you will save it and what do you benefit if you gain the whole world but lose your own soul. Is anything worth more than your soul? And so, yeah, it is a cost. Yeah, people, you know, it's no, it's not even worth it to sugarcoat it. Like, oh, you're going to be okay. You know, people are No, there will be people who understand, but there will be people who come at you. Your DMs will be flooded with people calling you all types of names. People that you thought were your lifelong brothers and sisters will look at you different. But what does it really matter? Because at the end of the day, the scripture says we don't live for the things of this world. We live for those things that are eternal. And really all these things, Hebrews talks about one day God is going to shake the earth and that which can be shaken will be shaken and that which cannot be shaken will remain. These are false kingdoms that when God comes back, these kingdoms are going to be crumbling to the ground and you want to be under the, the true kingdom that's going to, the only kingdom that's going to last. And so I think you just have to count the cost. Um, you know, a lot of times when people count the cost, they're not looking at the cost appropriately. They're thinking just, you know, well, I'm going to have to give up my friends. I'm going to have to give up 
the letters, my nice line jacket, my nice license plate. But do you want to give up the mansion that Jesus said, I want to prepare a place for you and I'm going to come back to give you? Do you want to give up that treasure? Is that what is that really worth giving up just to wear these three little letters, some ugly paraphernalia? Because all that paraphernalia is uncomfortable. Um, so, let's, you know, like, is it really worth it? Let's count up the true cost when we talk about, you know, counting the cost. No, that's that is good, Ashton. And what it is also is that you have a lot of people in these organizations who want to have their cake and eat it too. They want to have one foot in the church. They want to have one foot in the world. They want to be in their organization and everything be kumbaya with Jesus. But I like what Second Corinthians six fourteen through eighteen says. It says, "Do not be unequally bound together with unbelievers. Do not make mismatched alliances with them, inconsistent with your faith. For what partnership can righteousness have with lawlessness? Or what fellowship can light have with darkness?" What harmony can there be between Christ and Belial, Satan? Or what does a believer have in common with an unbeliever? What agreement is there between the temple of God and idols? For we are the temple of the living God. Just as God said, I will dwell among them and walk among them, and I will be their God, and they shall be my people. So come out from among them, unbelievers, and be separate, says the Lord, and do not touch what is unclean, and I will graciously receive you and welcome you with favor. And I will be a father to you and you will be my sons and daughters, says the Lord Almighty. Now, of course, a lot of these people, are, oh, I'm still a son and daughter of God. You know, well, not really because you're in league with Satan and the devil's laughing at them because they don't even realize it. And, and the gray area is disappearing in, in, in this time we're in right now. You're either with God or you're with the devil. That gray area is gone. And there is a reason why God is allowing people to see the idolatry in these organizations in this time. It didn't happen so much 20 years ago or 10 years ago, but now in this time, why? God is saying, hurry up, get out. I'm about to do something. Something's about to come. I um, I had a, I got a DM from a young lady who um, was wants to renounce, and but she's a legacy. So we don't, we didn't really even touch on like the, the connection with the generations of people who, are in these organizations and feel like this is my like mom, my dad, like there's people like I, I'm not comfortable doing this or I want to do this, but this is my family. This is not just my friends that I met in these organizations. And so I was thinking about like what she wrote to me and I went to the um, scripture. God brought to my mind the scripture in Matthew chapter 10, verse starting at verse um uh, starting at verse 34, do not suppose that I have come to bring peace to the earth. I did not come to bring peace, but a sword for I have come to turn a man against his father, a daughter against her mother, a daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law. A man's enemies will be the members of his own household. Anyone who loves their father or mother more than me is not worthy of me. Anyone who loves their son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me. Whoever does not take up their cross and follow me is not worthy of me. Whoever finds their life will lose it. And whoever loses their life for my sake will find it. And so I was thinking about her and I, and we had, I, I talked to her a little bit um, through the messages on Instagram, but she just opened my eyes to the, the, the individuals who are legacies in these organizations who are struggling with denouncing. But I think it goes back to Lala, like you said before, God asked you like me or Delta. So it now becomes like your mom and dad or like your salvation, like me, God, or my mom, my dad, my cousin, like all of these people. Um, Because even when God was dealing with me in my prayer time, when I was like, why? I don't understand. He said, like, are you willing to are you willing to bet your life on this? Are you willing to lose your life for this? Um, and so those individuals, especially who are legacies in these organizations, you have to be encouraged by the word of God. God already knows that, you know, all of our some of our family members may not you know get to the place that we are spiritually or be believers ever but some of them may because of prayer because of you know you but somebody has to start and if it's you who who's getting this like conviction then you might need you might be the person who will bring out your generation um from from this this curse who will bring out your generation from from this covenant that they started way before you because there's people who have literally had individuals in these organizations and their families since the beginning of the organizations. 
Um, and God talks about, you know, punishing generations for the sins of their their ancestors. So that's that's the one thing that I, I thought about with the with the whole denouncing and how hard it is for people who also have the familial connection to these organizations, not just friendships. All of that is so good. Um, when I think of counting the cost, I think that it's hard to count the cost of anything if you don't have the fact in front of you. And I feel like in this conversation, we have to point to the origin again of these organizations. Um, and that was a poor exigent, exigent, exigences. Is that how exigent? How am I saying it? Exegesis. Yeah. Thank you. Ex I always the e, the e. Okay, a poor exegesis. Hello to scripture. And again, how that was used uh, to dehumanize and devalue African American bodies, and from that bitterness, that resentment, instead of giving that to the Lord, that's why um, the church is so entwined with these organizations because that's where we found Black identity and Black dignity. But that identity, but that can only be found in the power of the gospel, and that can only be found when we um, point out that uh, a lot of commentators got it wrong. A lot of those people professing to come in Jesus' name, they misuse and twisted scripture. But when you sit at the foot of the cross, the Lord, uh, through the power of the Holy Spirit, the spirit of truth, um, uses, um, excuse me, he restores us with truth, what he actually means in his word, which is why it's so important um, when you're in, when you're looking for that to really go to God with it. Because everything that um, culture may be telling you, um, most things culture is telling us are our lies from the enemy. And um, it's important not to just think about what culture says about something, but like, where was God in this moment? Lord, what are you saying about this thing? Um, and so, yeah, that will empower you to count the cost if you see things accurately. And we can only see it accurately discernment. Yeah, that's good. That's good. So before we end the video, I want to open up the floor for any comments, any reflections, any um, thoughts for those that are watching, for those that are watching, anything, anything, any last comments, anybody want to share any last thoughts? Uh, Mark 7, um, going back to Mark 7, 8, like when we abandon the commandments of the Lord and follow after the traditions of men, that's going to lead to death. I will, I will let this be my last comment in Joel chapter two. So God is speaking to people. He's prophesying to the people. And we talk about that scripture a lot. Um, you know, God is going to restore to you everything that the enemy took from you. And, um, you know, as you were saying, count the cost, the Holy Spirit was just bringing back, that back to my mind. And so many times we take that scripture out of context, thinking that the enemy just took things from these people. But God says that I'm the one who sent those locusts on your land because of your sin. And so, you know, these people, they were in sin. They were going through famine. They were going through all of this hardship because of their sin. And even in that, God says, I will restore to you everything that the, that the enemy stole, everything that the locusts that I allowed to come to you, I will restore that to you once you repent and once you come back to me. And so even when we think about counting the cost, you know, everything that everything that we think we'll lose, God says, I will restore that to you and I will restore it to you better. He says, when you eat the fruit that I give to you, not only will you be full, but you will be satisfied. And so a lot of times we think about when we leave this life that I'm just going to be bored. I'll be lonely. I'll be miserable. But God says, and hear this by the Spirit, he says, you will be satisfied with what I restore you. You are going to enjoy your life after this. You will, there will be joy, there will be pleasure, and there will be more grace upon your life after you leave these organizations. Because the scripture continues, he says, then after doing all those things, I will pour out my spirit upon you. God is looking for people that are hungry for the spirit of God so that he can pour his spirit out and anoint them to go out and do even greater works. The anointing breaks yokes. So God wants to pour out his anointing so that people can go out and minister and lay hands and destroy the works of the enemy. So when we think about counting the cost, whatever we lose in these orgs, God is going to restore a hundredfold. And then this fruit will last. The fruit of these orgs is wicked, and when you eat rotten fruit, you get sick from it, and eventually you start vomiting, your body breaks down. When you eat the fruit of the Spirit, it's only going to nourish you, and that'll be fruit that you want to continue to eat. From. That's that's the legacy that we want to leave, leave to our children. 
to piggyback off of Ashton, uh, Hebrews 12, 14 says, pursue peace with all people and holiness without which no one will see the Lord. Uh, it's okay to not be in with the cool crowd in these organizations. Seeing the Lord, being of one mind with him is so much better in this life and in the life to come. Because these organizations will not follow into the afterlife, into the next one. They lead to, they lead to hell. So pursue holiness, seeing the Lord so much better than anything this world can offer. And these organizations can offer. Um, the, the one thing that I want to kind of end with for me is I, before this, I said, and I'm like, okay, let me think of the concepts and themes. And one of the first ones was encouragement that God brought me to. He's like, don't you get on there saying all this stuff and you don't encourage the people at the end. <laughs> so um, first Peter uh, chapter three, verse 13 starts off by saying, who is going to harm you if you are eager to do good? But even if you should suffer for what is right, you are blessed. Do not fear their threats. Do not be frightened. But in your hearts, revere Christ as Lord. Always be prepared to give an answer to everyone who asks you to give the reason for the hope that you have. But do this with genuine gentleness and respect, keeping a clear conscience so that those who speak maliciously against your good behavior in Christ may be ashamed of their slander. For it is better if it is God's will to suffer for doing good than for doing evil. Um, so like my encouragement for people is like, if you're at a point or if you eventually will get to this point in your life where you're questioning, like renouncing, understand that if you, if you get to that place, that's the Holy spirit and he's graced you already for this journey. Like you're already graced for this journey. God is with you. You don't have to fear anyone. I love the, the song, the Lord is my light and salvation. Whom shall I fear? Whom shall I be afraid? I had to say certain scriptures to myself. I would not have a spirit of fear, or timidity. Like I had to repeat that to myself on this journey. And even before I got ready to say out loud that I wasn't a part of these organizations because I was so scared. And so like, that would be the encouragement for individuals watching who are questioning um, and who may get to that point at some point in their life of wanting to denounce, like God is with you. Like he's there. The word is what will strengthen you. Um, being around other people who are not in the organization that are believers, but other people who have also walked this walk. Um, I was very, very excited when Lala responded back to my DM after I watched her video. And I feel like she probably responds to everybody. So like, I feel like all even on this video, like all the individuals on here, you could email them or DM them, and they probably will answer you. Like, I have answered people, so you're not alone. Um, so be encouraged by that, knowing that there are other people who are willing to, to stand alongside you and hold you up um, and, and be there for you and encourage you through, through God, through the Holy Spirit. Yeah, that's so good. That is so good. And actually, to transition, Tori, um, before we close, does everyone want to provide their social media? Is that is that OK? Just in case anybody wants to, you know, send a DM, have any questions, you know, comments, not comments, just questions and encouragement. I don't know. But anybody want to DM us? Um, Ashley, you want to provide your, your Instagram? Sure. Yeah. So my Instagram is I'll spell it out. So it's A S H. T O N O R R E L L. You know, my 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 profile is public, so feel free to you know message me, whatever, comment. I'm always open to having conversations, even if you're not ready to make the you know, don't feel like you have to come to me any type of way. I'm open to have any conversation. And you don't like even if you're not even if you don't want to renounce, we're still open to having conversations because one plants the seed and another waters and God will bear the fruit. So my DMs are open. Amen. Sure. Uh, my Instagram is handle is uh, Mr. That's M R underscore Marcus one 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 five eleven fifteen. Okay, good, good, good. Chelsea, did you want to provide your Instagram? Yes. My Instagram is Chelsea underscore with two S's. And come on by and find me some encouragement, motiv encouragement, motivation, um, and some and just some joy as you walk on this journey. Mm -hmm. Yes. My Instagram is Tor, T-O-R underscore B, B-E-E -E underscore J, J-A-Y on Instagram. And like I said already, like you can DM me, 
And I'm happy to have a conversation with you, especially echoing what Ashton said, whether you're at that place or not, um, where you're ready to renounce or you're even considering, or I actually will open up the door for those individuals who want to have a healthy debate. You can email me now. The last video, I was like, don't be in my DMs trying to argue with me. But this time, like, I'm ready. So if you want to talk, we can talk. <laughs> Man, that's good, Tori. Don't DM me them, though. Because <laughs> yeah, you can hit Tori up, though, because okay. I can't be debating, arguing, nothing. Like, okay. But if y'all, and my Instagram is Lala underscore Jenkins. If you want to hit your girl up, we can talk, we can chat. Um, but yeah, thank y'all so much. This is the end of our video. Thank y'all for watching. Thank you, panel, Ashton, Marcus, Chelsea, Tori. This was amazing. Amazing, amazing. So thank y'all for answering yes or being obedient to the call from the Holy Spirit. Okay. Glory to God for y'all's obedience. Okay. But yeah, so that, that's all I have. Um, so thank y'all for watching. Don't forget to like, subscribe, and comment. Bye.